Smiles. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Secrets of the Deep Dark Below. Um, I actually am really going to focus on two of the mammals. I'm going to touch briefly on voles, but I'm mostly going to focus on the star-nosed mole and the short-tailed shrew. Um, and maybe I'll have to come back and do a, a whole nother talk on voles. So I want to just start off by telling you a little bit about the Harris Center where I work. Um, and this is a place where I've worked for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. It's it's a spot where um, located in Hancock, New Hampshire. And um, if you haven't been up there and you're nearby, come swing by. Our building's closed. Um, it's by appointment only, but our grounds are always open. Um, and I guess, too, I want to talk about what we do at the Harris Center. We teach a lot of people about nature of all ages. We have programs for um, elementary through, well, preschool all the way through high school. Um, and we do this in 30 different public schools in the Monadnock region. We also work in community programs from preschoolers like this program, which is a babies in backpacks, all the way to um, a program for um, people in hospice or assisted living facilities. So that's um, pretty interesting. We like to call this our lifespan education program. Um, over the past 50 years, the Harris Center has protected over 24,000 acres of land in the Monadnock region. We work with landowners and other conservation organizations to do this, and all of our properties are open to the public. So come check us out. Um, not only are we protecting land for people, but we're really interested in protecting land for wildlife. That's kind of our two goals is room to roam for wildlife and um, places for people to go to find kind of a respite and to give back a little bit of reciprocity to the natural world. Lately, one of our newest endeavors is to provide conservation research and citizen science opportunities for people. It helps connect them to our wild lands like this, which is our um, Pac-Banadnock Raptor Observatory. We co-sponsor that with New Hampshire Audubon. You might have heard of our salamander brigades where we cross thousands of spotted salamanders, wood frogs, and spring peepers across busy roads in the spring, or nighthawk monitoring, and cyanobacteria monitoring is our latest one. So all in all, I guess what I would say is if you haven't checked out the Harris Center, come check us out. You can find us online at theharriscenter.org. Um, so some of you might have remembered my last talk with Chesterfield um, about coyotes, bears, and fisher. Oh my. Um, that was a talk that was really about educating us about these animals that we coexist with, these big animals. But this talk, it springs from a different place. This is a talk that springs from a place that I have loved for a long time. It started here at the Museum of Natural History in New York City, where I spent lots of my time. And if you've ever been there, it's filled with huge, great big animals, dioramas like these elephants, T-Rexes, a blue whale um, skeleton that hangs from the ceiling. But as a child, um, sometimes that was just a little too big for me. And I found myself really focused in, on these cross sections of what it, what it looked like under the earth. Um, and I would spend a lot of time in front of these kind of thinking about what was right under our own feet. And this didn't just stop with me thinking about um, the natural world, I took it into the literary world. And I, I loved books like Wind in the Willows. And I looked for Badger Hall wherever I went. And then when I was about nine, this classic book came into my, my little dreamy nine-year-old hands. This is a book about gnomes. It, it was set up like a field guide. And I really believed that there were gnomes um, out in the world. And I spent a lot of my childhood searching for gnome homes um, under logs and anywhere that I could find sort of an entrance into the underground. I still kind of do that today. I haven't given up on finding a gnome. I'll let you know if I do. Um, along my ways, I did find some amazing and magical things. I haven't found a gnome yet and I haven't discovered Badger Hall, but I have found things like this. Beautiful spotted salamanders or also known as mole salamanders. And like the featured animals I'm going to talk about today, the star-nosed mole, and the short-tailed shrew. 
these are amazing animals. And my work as a naturalist with a special interest in, in mammals, that's sort of my specialty, it really grew my curiosity about the subterranean world. And really, I was interested from one mammal to another, what kind of tools an animal, a mammal would need to live in this underground environment? How could they survive under the ground? I was really curious about that. And I did a lot of reading and exploring and took a lot of courses. And as I dug into the subterranean world, I discovered that the living world beneath our feet is really just as fascinating and filled with mind blowing animals they would just blow you away. You don't even have to go to like the Great Barrier Reef or search the deep tro tropics. You can just think about and look at what's under the ground. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to do this than to travel someplace. And this world is really fascinating. And tonight, I hope that you leave this presentation kind of feeling the same way that I do about these amazing animals. Um, underground is really a unique habitat. Just take a moment and think about what it must be like under there. It's dark, it's limited in oxygen, it's made up of, of sort of solid particles like little bits of soil, tiny sand, pebbles, rocks, giant rocks. It makes it hard to see, to breathe, and to even kind of move, but it does have its advantages. It offers safety from, met, from many predators and shelter from elements, including freezing temperatures, rain, um, extreme heat, places like uh, to go underground give you that opportunity to escape all of that. And if you're an animal that likes to eat um, invertebrates, it's a really great place to do your dining uh, because that's where a lot of small invertebrates live. But you have to have some really special tools to survive in this very challenging habitat. Just like you would need special tools if you lived in Antarctic or the Amazon rainforest, where you live really defines how you make your living and it, it makes you look the way you look. So before I get into the moles and shrews, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping with everybody and that's clearing up the small mammals of the world that, well, I'm just gonna focus on the small mammals of New Hampshire and the most common ones. So here's my down and dirty guide to some of the most common small mammals that live around here in this part of New Hampshire. If you hear some growling, it's not my stomach, it's my dog, I apologize. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start with the easiest and most common mammal that we encounter and that's mice. Um, so mice are rodents and they're herbivores, although I kind of consider them more omnivores. And I'm sure many of you who have encountered mice and um, having eaten things of your own home or things that you've left out, you recognize that they don't just eat um, plant material. They'll eat um, worms, they'll eat bird eggs, they'll eat very small um, other mammals like baby mammals. They're, they're kind of wild. So to call them an herbivore is not quite right, but they definitely are rodents. And in New Hampshire, here's just a few samples of who we've got in terms of mice. We have deer, mice, white-footed mouse, house mouse, and two types of jumping mice. And mice don't live underground. They might access a little nested area under some materials, but they're not underground dwellers. Um, and they don't look like underground dwellers. And we're going to get into what an underground dweller looks like in just a little bit. But they have big ears and cute big eyes and a twitchy nose. And they're, this is important. Their front paws are small and so are their hind paws. So everybody knows a mouse. So what's a vole? A vole is sometimes called a meadow mouse. Sometimes people ac accidentally call it that. But voles are really the mammals that we see a lot of right as winter sort of fades and we get thin snow and it begins to melt and you see all these tunnels and I have this this tunnel picture that you can see in the corner of the screen that tunnel if you see that in your yard that's a bowl and my my dear friend and boss at the Harris Center Dr. H. Mead Keto, although he's a geologist, he loves mammals too. Um, he has a saying and he says, don't blame the mole for the role of the vole. And this is really important. We're gonna be talking about this, but voles are the, the herbivores that really get into your stuff. They'll eat your bulbs, 
they're herbivores, really true herbivores. So they'll eat your bulbs, they'll girdle your trees. Um, if you have an orchard and you have fresh new little trees that you planted, saplings, they'll eat those. They'll eat any kind of thing left in the ground over the winter. And they eat a lot and they reproduce a lot. A vole looks really different than a mouse. It has short ears and um, it's tubbier. It's kind of a tubbier version. And we have a couple of different types of voles here. We have a meadow vole, a pine vole, and a red back vole. We most commonly see the meadow vole, and that's what typically you're seeing around your yard. And that's the one that causes some trouble. So moles, I don't want you to think that moles aren't full of some problems because they do tunnel and they'll leave mounds of um, earth in your land and they might leave raised ridges. But this is really important. And if there's like one thing you leave tonight knowing is that moles are insectivores primarily. And that means they eat insects. So they might chew away some of your bulbs if it's in the way of their run, but they're not they're not eating your, your bulbs. They're really just kind of moving them out of the way. So don't blame the mole for the role of the vole, please. They're in a different order than um, rodents. I'm not even gonna try and say this name, but it's something like, well, I guess I am, Uliopotophilia. Um, and that in Latin actually translates as truly fat and blind. <laughs> so that's the order that they belong in, not the rodent order. They're not rodents. We have only two types of moles here in New Hampshire. We have a hairy tailed mole and the star nose mole, who's going to be one of the stars of tonight's conversation. Um, and you can see the hairy tail mole and the star nose mole right there and a little clump of a mole tunnel. And just today I was walking my dog, I came across a mole tunnel and I thought how perfect. And I knew right away that it was a hairy tail mole and not a star nose mole. And by the end of this talk, you will know too. It has to do with where the where you find the, the, um, the mole hill. Now shrews, shrews are really kind of a unique animal and they actually are pretty common. Um, we have a couple of different types. We have long-tailed, I forgot to include the short-tailed. We have a pygmy mole, a vole, I mean shrew, it's even confusing for me, masked and a water shrew. And they're also in the same order as the mole, the truly blind and fat order. And they are exclusively insectivores. This is really important. They are exclusive insectivores. And today when we talk about the short-tailed shrew, it has a really unique way of getting its food. Um, really completely the only one, the only mammal in North America that has this. And I'll, I'll reveal that later. So, I think it's important to remember that regardless of what type of small mammal we're talking about, what we're really got to remember, what's important is that they are essential to the food web that we have. So they're eaten by many wild predators from hawks and other types of raptors, including um, owls, foxes, coyotes, bobcats, snakes, you name it. I kind of think of these small mammals as the fuel of this whole system packaged in a juicy and furry body. And without these small mammals, our predators wouldn't be able to exist in our woodlands and forests. So they're really essential to that. All right, now I'm going, This there won't be a test at the end of this, though I kind of want to give everybody a test. I'm going to go over these adaptations that an animal has to have if they're fossorial. So that's a new word for some of you, perhaps. Fossorial is just the name that we call an animal that lives underground. So if you live on top of the ground, you're terrestrial. If you live in trees, you're arboreal. If you live under the ground, you're fossorial. So think of fossil under the ground, fossorial. And these adaptations adaptations that, that um, shrews who are considered semi-fossorial and moles who are considered completely fossorial, these are common between the two of them. So first I'm going to talk about what they share, what's common between these two mammals, and then we're going to go into what makes each one really unique. So I'm going to dig down into the earthy environment. The first thing you ought to know is they all have a certain body shape. It's called fusiform and it's shaped like a spindle. Um, and that means that it's tapered at the front and tapered at the end and in the middle, it's kind of wide. And you can think of a spindle you might use if you're weaving. And this shape helps an animal move through substrate. 
And they're not the only animals that have a fusiform shape. If you can just think um, for a moment and imagine an animal that lives in the ocean, many ocean dwelling animals are also fusiform. Think of a dolphin in particular, or some types of seals where they're narrow at the snout widen out in the middle and then narrow again at the tail. And that's all has to do with the ability to move through substrate. So these animals are not moving through a liquid. They're really working their way through a solid, extremely challenging. And they have to have lots of adaptations to be able to access the underground. And one thing they have is really amazing fur. If you've ever get lucky enough to touch a mole, um, I recommend it. Their fur is velvety and it's short. If they had long wavy fur like I do, um, they would get covered in soil and dirt and it would really slow them down and it would be really messy and it might actually hurt their body because the jagged pieces of the soil. Instead, both shrews and moles have these very short and thick velvety fur and it's been described if you touch it as kind of slick. And that's so that dirt and mud doesn't really stick to it. So it's sort of kind of slick. And the coolest thing about it is you can pet a mole or a shrew in either direction. So just imagine your cat or your dog for a moment, or even yourself, and you touch your hair, it goes one way. There's like a grain to it. If you go the other way, um, you get messy hair or your dog doesn't like it or your cat tries to scratch you. But if you are petting a mole, you could pet it back and forth anyway. Each individual fur on both the mole and the shrew can swivel either direction. And that makes a lot of sense because they're in this tight tunnel, they have to be able to go forward and at the drop of the hat, they might have to go backwards. And so this way it doesn't break their hair. I think that's the coolest thing. And I know that engineers are looking at this because it's all about re reducing resistance in some substrates. I read a whole article about MIT um, researchers that are researching fossorial fur. Another thing that they have in common are what I like to call short limbs and big diggers. They've got really big front claws in proportion to their body. The one in the upper corner is the front claw of a star-nosed mole. Look at that thing, it's like a baseball mitt. And the one on the bottom is a short-tailed shrew. And they're really big because they're used for digging and they have a shortened limb because these aren't used for running. Ima imagine a mouse for a minute. They have these long limbs. Those are for scampering away. The short limb is full of muscle and it's got this giant mitt at the end and it's purely for digging. It has really long, exact exaggerated nails. And that's what they're digging with. They're not digging with their face. They're not digging with their tail or anything like that, or their body even. They're using their arms, their short limbs, and their claws. And they really have to be good diggers. Mole burrows can be, you know, 240 five feet in length, imagine that. I mean, that's a long burrow to be digging. Lots of people always wonder, how do they dig it? How does a, um, an animal dig it? And for moles, why do they pop? Why is there a big mole hill? Moles are really great at excavating. They'll go, um, they kind of dig and push in front of them and dig and push in front of them and dig and push in front of them. And then when it gets, the pile gets too big, they kind of do a somersault over the pile. And then they use that big front claw, like a bulldozer blade, and they push it up to the top of the tunnel and out of the tunnel. And that's why you get those raised mole hills, which is really unique. And shrews will do that to some extent, um, not as much. They don't have as big a blade to push it out. So short limbs and big diggers, both these animals have this in common. And Something they share is they have tiny ears and tiny eyes. The mole more so than the shrew. So the star-nosed mole has such tiny eyes that you really wouldn't be able to see them. And their ears are um, very, very small and kind of just hidden in that velvety, velvety fur. Imagine if you lived underground. If you had big eyes, they'd get full of dirt all the time and it wouldn't be useful. You wouldn't be able to see anything. So they didn't really need to have big eyes. They have other ways of sensing their environment. And I'll be talking about that. That's actually my favorite thing to talk about. But they have these tiny eyes and the same with their ears. If they had big ears, their ears would just get clogged up with dirt. So they have these small ears and instead, um, 
both these animals are really great at sensing vibration through their fur and through their whiskers. And the star-nosed mole, we'll be talking about its peculiar, very cute star-tipped nose in a few moments. And that's a real adaptation for sensing the world. So they don't really need big ears or big eyes. They have other ways of sensing the the dark world that they live in. I should mention too that moles have a lens that comes over their eyes that protects them sort of like uh, goggles. And this is my favorite, holy moly oxygen. This is just for the mole. It doesn't, uh, this does not apply to the shrew. The mole spends most of its life underground. And as you can imagine, there's not a lot of oxygen underground. It's in fact, full of carbon dioxide because they're breathing. So recently they've been able to discover that moles have a special molecule in their blood that helps them hold on to um, the hemoglobin. It binds the carbon dioxide and allows them to breathe in the same air they just breathed out without any type of ill effect. And again, scientists are studying this as well because this could be helpful for us if we have to go places where there might be limited oxygen. Instead of a lot of breathing apparatus, maybe there's a way that we could make our blood different and be able to hold that. So I know that they're studying this too. And I just like that. Holy moly oxygen. Okay. So you guys, um, you might not have known this, but in the 1950s, there was actually a movie called The Killer Shrews about shrews. And some people find the star-nosed mole really kind of weird. It's always in the weirdest animal of the world books. But today, what I'd like to do is do a comparison of how these weird animals are really unique and special and maybe not weird, but kind of fascinating. Um, so pay attention because at the end, I'm gonna ask you to vote on which one you might like to be. So I'm gonna start off with the North Northern Short-Tailed Shrew. And these are just the facts about them. I thought people might like to know. They're not very big. They weigh hardly anything, half an ounce basically. Um, you can see these animals anywhere. And in fact, they're one of the most common mammals in New Hampshire. You might not see them, but you might have heard them before. If you're in the woods and you think you hear a rustling in the leaves and you don't see a chipmunk or a squirrel, it could very well be a short-tailed shrew, kind of up on the upper layer, on the terrestrial layer, moving from one place to the other. Places to look for them, if you're interested, is kind of anywhere, deciduous and mixed forest, and occasionally even in the conifers. They really prefer loose soils and you can find them along um, stone walls and meadows, especially meadows that haven't been mowed. And if you ever are mowing your meadow um, after it's gone kind of long and feral, you might notice uh, some of these shrews kind of popping up and running in front of, away from your mower. So be careful, you don't wanna hit them, especially after I tell you this. Wow, he, shrew, this is gonna blow your mind away because I'm sure a lot of you prob probably have thought bats are so cool because they can echolocate. They use a sound like a sonar, it bounces off the animal. They might be the only type of animal that you know of that echolocate, but actually shrews echolocate. They don't have big eyes. They have to be able to sense their environment to be able to find their food. They let out a squeak and actually shrews are quite vocal. That's another thing you can listen for is squeaks in your neighborhood. Um, and this squeak hits something and it bounces back and it's supposedly be able to um, find it based on echolocating. However, this is a little bit controversial if you're a shrew scientist. And my friend Joe Merritt, who wrote a book called Small Mammals of the World, he says he doesn't think that's exactly right. He thinks they do a lot more with their whiskers and they have very long whiskers, sort of, sorry about that. Um, very long whiskers that it feels stuff and whisk things. And as they whisk across, he thinks, this is Joe Merritt, he thinks that that's how they're finding stuff. So I have a challenge for anybody out there who's looking for a new job or um, maybe um, a job after you retire, you could become a shrew researcher and try to resolve this. Are shrews hunting by echolocation or are they using their whiskers or is it a combination? Shrews are a bit like teenagers. They eat all the time and they're highly unselective about what they eat. They eat 
like anything they can get their teeth on, any kind of little animal, um, from bugs to caterpillars to lots of worms, they will eat some plant material. They basically eat their entire life through, they sleep a bit and occasionally they mate. So I like to think of that. A shrew diet eats and get this. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. 90 to 125% of their body weight every day. They're active throughout the winter, in the night, in the day. They basically are eating all of the time. They're foraging for periods up to a half an hour to two hours, and then they're sleeping. So they're eating or sleeping all the time. If it doesn't eat its body weight in food, um, it will starve. And this is, this is a problem if you ever do any live trapping of shrews, because if you do a, a live trap where you catch them, you have to catch, check your traps a lot, because if you don't check them every couple of hours, then the sh your subject matter will die. So they have an extremely efficient metabolism and they can assimilate up to 85% of what they've eaten into usable energy. That's incredible. They have very little waste. They're eating all the time. And one of my favorite um, naturalists, Mark Elbrock, in his um, writing, he's, I love this description. I'm gonna read it to you. To consider the life of a shrew is to consider what it must be like to weigh as little as a cotton ball to catch and subdue other animals for food and to have a metabolism that runs so fast, you are in constant fear of starving to death. That's Mark Elbrock's description of the shrew. So this is what makes a shrew a standout tonight. Um, and that is the shrew <laughs> has venom. It is the only venomous mammal in all of North America. Its venom is closely related to the bearded lizard or the king cobra. It secretes it from its um, submaxillary gland, like under its bottom teeth, and it will bite its prey. And it, it doesn't kill the prey. It simply paralyzes the prey. It's a neurotoxin. Um, it is, um, get this, one shrew's bite can, one shrew in its lifetime contains enough of this neurotoxin to kill up to 200 mice in its lifetime. That's a lot. The saliva flows into the wound through a channel in the groove of its bottom incisors. Um, and it um, immobilizes the mammal. And this enables them to do what, what scientists have termed live Hoarding. So an animal that hoards its food is an animal that stores it. And there's different types of hoarders. There might be like a, um, like a chipmunk where it hoards it all in one place, or there might be like a squirrel that scatter hoards. But shrews are the only ones that are live hoarders. So they'll bite an, ins an animal, let's say an earthworm, which is the most common thing that they will eat. It paralyzes the worm and then they'll leave the worm in a larder in their burrow. And if they can't find any other food, they'll come back and eat it. And once scientist um, found that a mealworm was kept alive, paralyzed for up to 15 days. That's like a nightmare. No wonder why they made a horror movie called The Attack of the Killer Shrews. That's not any way I would like to go, but it, it's really effective for the shrew, considering that if it doesn't eat every two hours, it's gonna die. So live hoarding is a way that it guarantees it can eat something and it will use this to kill things that are larger than themselves. It's not uncommon that they might um, Paraly do this to a mouse, a small mouse, even a young mole, a small baby mole. Lots of things have been found in their larders. And when they've done stomach studies of shrews, they find um, mammal fur in it pretty regularly. So uh, something to maybe hopefully inspire you in some way to think about the shrew differently. This might do it for you too. Scientists are actually studying this neurotoxin in ways that it might be helpful to people. And one thing is to help migraine headaches, but it might be something that, that people use as the new Botox. So instead of getting a, an injection of Botox, you might get an injection of shrew venom. I don't know. I think I'll keep my wrinkles. Sounds a little scary. All right, so that's really unique adaptations of the um, 
short-tailed shrew. And now I want to talk about the star-nosed mole. And I, I have a true confession. I, I love the star-nosed mole. It's really an animal that um, I've been just so into. And so this part, um, I'm going to go into some detail, uh, particularly about its nose. Before I do that, I just want to give you the particulars. It's a, it's a little bit similar size to the shrew, but it weighs a lot more. It's often described as pudgy, which I think is kind of cute. Its color is blackish or brownish, kind of a combination. And this is what's unique about the star-nosed mole. It, it likes wet ground near water bodies, swamps, wet meadows, seeps in a field. And you can find them in hardwoods, but um, there have to be water stands nearby. And I'm gonna talk about why as we find out what it likes to eat. But first, Let's talk about this nose. Check that thing out. Wow, look at it, it's like a flower. It's spectacular. It's the sniffer that's like a star, a flower attached to a chubby velvety mole. I mean, isn't that just amazing? It's unreal. After you find out what this thing can do, you're gonna want one of these for yourself. Not the mole, but the nose maybe. <laughs> um, here's a close up of it. It's made up of 22 tentacles that are called rays. And the rays are fleshy and they're, um, they're, they're designed so it's a match on either side. Um, they have you know, 11 on one side and 11 on the other and they're, they're of equal size and um, just symmetry across the mole's nose. It's, okay, this is the part where it gets really cool. They are sensitive tactile appendages covered with sensory receptors that respond to touch and seismic vibrations. So any kind of movement under the ground, um, this is gonna pick up. Check this out. There's over 100,000 nerve endings crammed into the area roughly the size of a human fingertip. Okay, just let that sink in for a minute. 100,000 nerve endings in one area the size of a human fingertip. They are unique to this species alone. And it is, the star nose mole is the most sensitive touch organ, that, that nose is the most sensitive touch organ in the entire animal kingdom. And it lives right here in New Hampshire. So we have like a superhero right here in New Hampshire. By comp comparison, the human hand only has 17,000 nerve endings in it. So compare that to this snout where the, just 100,000, that's crazy to me. Here's a close up picture of it on the electron microscope. The star nose moles rays, each one, so each, there's 22 of them, each one can move independently and can flex forward and backwards at 90 degrees. They are not used to grab things. So it's not like an elephant's trunk that's used to grab things. And they're actually not even used for smelling. They are used as like what we call extra sensitive fingertips. And this helps the mole make sense of the world. It sees the world through touch. So a, the tactile receptors that cover the surface of the nose have actually have a special name. They're called Emor's Emer's organs, and it ends up that all moles have Emer's organs on their stout, but the star nose mole is the star of it. It has the most, it has the champion. It has over 25 to 30,000 Emer organs studying the entire surface of their nasal passage. And this is really important. Here's a close up view. This shows the abundance of those specialized nerves. The, the nerves work in conjunction with the mole's brain. So as best as a scientist can figure out, when the mole feels something, it's able to send a message to the brain and the brain is able to create an image so it can make a map. And this is, um, here's a quote from Ken Cantania. He works at Vanderbilt University and believe it or not, he's the expert star nose mole researcher. He's one of my heroes. He says, star nose moles have extremely efficient nervous systems that convey information from the environment to their brains at speeds approaching the physiological limits of a neuron. I like to imagine that it's faster than the internet. Forget 5G, you guys wanna sign up for star nose mole rays or something like that. That's a lot of information that can enter into the mole's kind of consciousness, like at a flash. And these animals are moving fast. 
I think a great way of describing the star nose mold, and here's just different kind of views of it and cross sections, is that it's a nose that looks like a hand, but acts like an eye. So it's a nose, I'm gonna say it again, that looks like a hand, but it acts like an eye for the mole. And it's really fast. It can touch as many as 10 different objects in a single second. While the mole searches through the mud, it's searching for its prey, which mostly include worms and small invertebrates. It's not, um, it's not gonna be eating other types of mammals typically. It can identify an individual prey in just eight milliseconds. That's super fast. They also have a high metabolism and they need to eat pretty con constantly, um, which brings it to another thing that the star nose mole is champion of. It is the fastest eater of any mammal on earth, which includes my son Liam at 19, who I thought was the fastest eater on earth, but no, it's the star nose mole. And just when you thought this, chubby little pudge, star nose mole, couldn't get any more amazing. It might actually surprise you that it's a champion swimmer. It's most of its food comes from underwater. 75 to 85% of its food is caught in the water, eating mostly aquatic earthworms that live in the water and um, water beetle larvae and be water beetles themselves. The star nose mole, I like to call him the Michael Phelps. <laughs> it's the best swimmer of all moles. It actually ends up that most moles can swim, but the star nose mole is the best at swimming. It has a two times the lung capacity of any other mole and it's actually classified, this is so cool. It's fossorial, so it lives under the ground and it's semi-aquatic. And its back feet, as you can see in this picture, are also bigger than most moles back feet and it uses that for swimming as well. And this is actually when I first saw my um, first star nose mole was swim I was at Willard Pond in um, Antrim, New Hampshire and I was drying off on a rock. And as I was sitting there, I, I looked in the water and I saw a star nose mole swimming came out right from a rock pile on the tip of the water and I watched it and I that's what caught me um, and what's amazing about this is that this is new they're just discovered after being able to watch star nose moles in the lab underwater they noticed that they were blowing bubbles out of their nose and they were able to determine that they are actually smelling under the water that the bubbles are capturing the odors because they would breathe out the bubbles and then they'll breathe them back in and it gives them a scent and they've watched them follow a scent trail. Um, they'll, so they'll bubble for like about five to 10 bubbles per second and then pull them back in and that helps them key into um, what prey is down there for them to catch. Because remember, they really can't see. They don't really have great eyes and they, um, it's a pretty cool adaptation. So this is actually the first mammal that's been capable of using its olfactory skills to um, smell underwater, which is pretty fascinating. So tonight I have presented the life of fossorial and semi-fossorial animals, the star-nosed mole and the short-tailed shrew. And I have a question for you. So I'm gonna ask Miles to launch the poll, Miles. We are gonna ask you, who would you wanna be? Star-nosed mole or short-tailed shrew? So think about it. Would you like to have a flower at the tip of your nose or would you like to have a venomous bite that helps you paralyze your prey? Wow. <laughs> this is pretty exciting. We have some great voting going on. Oh, it's getting close. Wow, everybody's voting. I really appreciate you. Take a minute and think. If you could be one of these, who would you be? Just give it a couple of seconds more. It's a hard choice. All right, Miles, what do you say? We'll end the poll. And the winner of tonight's poll, not a surprise for me, is the star nose mole at 53%. Not too bad. The short-tailed shrew, not as charismatic, did pretty good at 38%. I don't know. Imagine if you combine the star nose mole and the venomous shrew, what kind of creature would you have? So that's my talk for tonight. And Miles, if we have any questions, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if there's any questions that um, you wanna share and I'll be happy to answer them, I hope. Yeah, sure. There were, thank you for that presentation, by the way. You're welcome. Everybody loved that. It was uh, <laughs> very entertaining and very informative. Um, so yeah, we did get some questions. 
Um, there was questions about, are these animals, the shrew and the mole, are they diurnal, nocturnal, or when do we usually see them? Are they above ground at certain certain times? Such great questions. Um, because they have, both of these animals have to eat all the time, they are active, they're not really, di they don't keep um, a circadian rhythm like you or I would. So to say that they're, if they're active day or night, they're active all the time because they're eating all the time. Um, and that, you know, if you got to eat all the time, you're not sleeping. In fact, actually, I should, let me reverse that. Let me just say they're sleeping all the time with occasional eating in between, because when you measure how often they sleep compared to how often they feed, they're sleeping a lot more than they're feeding. But if they don't feed, particularly the shrew with his very fast metabolism, it will, it doesn't end good for the shrew. So um, when you can see them, the, sh the short-tailed shrew, um, if you go in the woods and you're quiet and you sit still in a kind of mixed forest, um, you might hear them, they're, they're, they squeak, they rustle, um, and you might get lucky enough to see one. They actually move really fast. And the same with the mole, the star-nosed mole, Oh man, I just felt so lucky the time I saw it in the water. And ever since then, I've been looking and looking and looking and I have yet to find another one. So I think it's it's sort of by chance and good luck in my opinion. Um, you can find a hairy tail mole probably a little bit easier if, the, if you if you wanna find a star nose mole, look around wet wetlands and wet soils. The hairy tail mole, um, that's more your garden variety mole and you should be seeing their tunnels right about now. They're popping up. So, all right, I hope that's, I answered that question. Yeah, and that sparked a lot of follow-up questions. <laughs> Jill was asking if uh, they're active during the winter. What do they do? Yeah, bo they're both still active all winter. They don't have enough. I should have mentioned that the shrew does not store fat and that's why it's metabolism is so fast. It just eats it and turns it into energy. So it has no way to store fat. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not a good thing. So they have to be active all year round. And you know, if you're if you're fossorial, if you live under the ground, that's a pretty great place to live during the winter. You're protected from the elements. All the invertebrates are down there. Some sleeping animals are down there. You might be able to, you know, steal some of their food or eat some of them, and they're unsuspecting with your venomous bite. Um, you know, so that they're they're active all year round, and, and winter is no exception for them. No sleep for the shrew or mole. And then we have some questions about handling them. Brian is asking, <laughs> if you handle them with their, will their bite hurt? And are there safe ways to handle them? That's a great question. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a great idea to handle any small mammal. I mean, in general, you don't wanna be bitten by any of a small wild mammal. The, the short-tailed shrew, people who have bitten, been bitten by them do experience um, some localized swelling. I mean, it's a venom, it's a neurotoxin. Um, and depending on how your own body reacts to it, it can depend on how serious it is. I don't know of anybody who's died. That's just my research. I haven't come across any fatalities from a short-tailed shrew bite. But my good friend, Julie Brown, who's a naturalist, a fabulous naturalist, she did get bit by one. After she picked it up, she said, oh, it's it's one of these short-tailed shrews. It's venomous. And then it bit her. <laughs> and then her fingers swelled up and she got, um, she just had some big swollen finger and kind of localized um, swelling, kind of like a bee sting. You know, it doesn't have enough venom to her hurt a human, but if you maybe had, if you were predisposed to having an allergic reaction to um, bearded lizard venom, you probably wouldn't want it. <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to pick up a shrew. And even though I would really want to pick up a mole, um, when I was taking my small mammals class, whenever we handled any small mammal, we did wear leather gloves. You don't want to be bitten by any of them. Their bites can, you know, lead to other illnesses. So although it's tempting, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably kiss one and then I'd really be in trouble. <laughs> um, Norma is wondering how shrew. long how long they live. How long? Short. They have a very short lifespan um, and they have a high reproduction. So really, you know, they're not long lived. If they live a year, that's long lived for them. I'd, I'd have to check on, on the exact number, but um, typically with small mammals, 
it's a short life and it's and they're eaten by so many predators um so even the ones that are you know fossorial you would think like um a mole would have a lot of protection because it spends so much of its life underground but even a mole sometimes comes up and there's um, predators that are able to get them down below, including um, weasels and snakes and things like that. And maybe a shrew, a very hungry shrew. That kind of brings us to their social life and uh, how they raise families and the, with those high demands on their body, how do they accomplish that? Yeah, they're considered pretty asocial, um, both shrews and moles. They don't have like family units. And for some small mammals um, in the wintertime, they might go from being, you know, asocial during the rest of the year and then social during the winter just to get that body warm. A vole is a really good example of that, um, the meadow vole. But the shrew and the mole, basically the males mate with as many females as they can. The females raise and rear the young on their own. The young like I think a shrew, um, I want to say like a, sh a shrew's baby is like ready to be independent in a very short amount of time. I don't recall the exact number, but you could definitely look that up. It's a really fast life cycle and it's like, boom. And a lot of the little ones, the, the new juveniles are the ones that will be eaten too. So life in the, the fast lane. Life in the, fa life in the fa fast lane underground. <laughs> And uh, here's a classic question of um, people's got have dogs and cats and they're wondering, uh, Janet's wondering if the toxin would be enough to hurt your, your pets. Yeah, um, it could be. I mean, um, one of my dogs ate a, a red, a red eft, a, an Eastern newt and was terribly ill. She had a neurotoxin poisoning because newts are poisonous or toxic, not, not poisonous. Um, and she was sick. So, you know, if, if you had a small dog, I think, and a, a shrew gave it a nip, it might cause some problems and you might have to bring your dog to the vet. Um, same with your cat, I would guess. What's really unique about the short-tailed shrew, I should mention, is that lots of um, predators don't eat it. And I've come across this and anybody out in the, in the world who's been out tracking a lot, you'll come across a spot where it looks like an animal's dug something up um, probably a fox or a coyote, and next to it is a little carcass of a little looks, you might have thought it was like a little gray lint ball, but a lot of times it's a shrew. They don't taste good. Um, it might be the toxin, it might be a gland or an odor, but a lot of times they aren't eaten. Um, so I have found lots of short-tailed shrews in the winter um, dug up by desperate animals to think maybe it'll taste good this time and then it doesn't. So I, you don't really typically See them being eaten. Oh, their main predator are raptors and other types of birds. Raptors don't really have a sense of smell. And so, you know, whether the shrew smells bad or tastes bad, they don't really care. They're just going to eat it. Nice. Super, super cool. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions about superlatives. To, Emily was asking, mm -hmm. uh, she's got a two foot diameter pile of sand atop where her leech field is. And what is there a record for the largest molehill? How big piles do they make? <laughs> Their piles can be really big. I mean, um, that sounds really big. It might be something else. And the sandy soil is not so much the mole's cup of tea. Um, both the hairy, the, uh, the hairy tail and the, um, and the star nose mole, the star nose mole likes those wet soils. The hairy tail mole likes well-drained soils like your garden um, might be a good spot. So if you're finding a sand pile, it might be something else. If it's that big, you know, I would consider woodchuck, um, maybe even a fox in a fox den. But if you find a dirt pile, they can be quite large. And sometimes it's, you know, a mole working and it and it's, think about that. It's a really can make a huge kind of array or network of tunnels and runways and they have resting chambers and nesting chambers and um, so there's a lot of dirt that has to get excavated out and so sometimes they'll use the same place and the pile can get quite big and I, I know I'm going to anticipate that people want to know about keeping moles out of your garden right is there a question about that uh, actually the the next question was uh, from Jacqueline do shrews help aerate the soil with their tunnels but it kind of hand in hand. Do we want them in our yards or do we not want them? 
Well, I do. <laughs> and I hope all of you do after hearing about how amazing they are, because they are. I mean, think about this. I mean, think about the adaptations we just talked about. That's pretty awesome. And um, it's good to remember that they're not the ones that are really eating your plants. Blame the vole, but still don't hurt the vole. <laughs> but blame, it's not the mole or the shrew, typically. Um, so, you know, all right, maybe they make your grass look a little bit unsightly, especially the mole, if it makes a ridge. So moles leave mole hills, that's when they're excavating, but sometimes they'll leave what's called a mole ridge, which is, it almost looks like um, a little snake or a wave went through your ground and kind of just pushed up the top layer. I'm sure people have seen that. It will be kind of um, sinuous and that can be unsightly on your lawn, but it's temporary they're not going to be using it. They're, this see, it there's a seasonality to it. And, and now's the time that they're doing it. They're kind of reclaiming and digging and um, all those kinds of things. So I would just be patient with the moles and the shrews. And do they help your, do they help your environment? Of course, they're eating garden pests, you know, eating the bugs that might eat your garden. They're helping to feed amazing predators that everybody would love to see, like who wouldn't want an owl around their house or a red-tailed hawk or something incredible like that. Um, so, I mean, they are the fuel to, to the system. The last thing that you would want to do is use any type of poison to kill them. And I'm just going to, I just might, maybe Pam won't invite me back to speak, but I'm going to speak my heart on this. Um, any type of rodenticide or any type of poison that you put out in the environment that you think is targeting one animal is not targeting that one animal. That animal that eats it then has the poison in them. And then once it's eaten by another animal, the poison travels up the, the chain. Um, and we are seeing that um, our raptors are being in particular really affected by rodenticide. So don't poison them, be open-minded. We live, we live in this world, we have to share it. So that's what I have to say about that. I hope you guys don't, uh, don't still invite me back to talk. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. thanks Susie for that, that vulnerability Is it, uh, in answering that. <laughs> somebody gave me a heart, I like that. Thank yeah. you, Judy. <laughs> Yeah, a couple, this has spurred a whole bunch of questions about um, these animals in the garden. And um, you talked about poisons, which we, we don't want to be used, but what about humane ways to keep them out of the garden if we, if we really don't want them there? Yeah, it's such a challenge to keep out like a vole out of your garden. The best thing that I would say um, is you know, if you're, if you have an orchard, I'll just start with the basic, you know, any type of predator guard you can put around any young trees that you're planting, um, that's the best way just to stop them from being able to get it. So, you know, they sell things that you can wrap around that. And that's, that's really helpful. In terms of voles in your garden, um, you know, I would say a fence, but voles, you, you could try a fence, you know, at least six inches down under the ground that will help. It's good to remember that voles are not fossorial. They don't go way under the ground, particularly the meadow vole, which is the one that would be most problematic in your garden um, and the one that, that, that we have the most kind of interaction with. Um, so if you get a good fence and you bury it pretty deep, that's gonna really do some help. And you're gonna need to use hardware cloth or something like that to bury it down deep. Um, and you have to pay attention to it. So that's probably my best advice or just say, okay, I have some food for me and some food for the vole, but the vole is feeding the owl that I also like or the bobcat that's important for me in my neighborhood or something like that. I don't know. So. Great, well, maybe one, one more question. And this was kind of a, we had some comments back when you were talking about the shrews having a live larder and that being really creepy. I know. Are these animals cute or are they gross? <laughs> what, the shrews, are the shrews cute? I think they're cute, <laughs> kind of gross at the same time, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, to judge something by how it looks is always never a great idea. I like, I think it's a really great adaptation. It's fascinating. And the fact that it's the only venomous mammal should be like, wow, it should be like a celebration how many venomous animals do you even know? I don't know any other ones off the top of my head. If, and, and, and in that sense, 
you know, maybe they would think that we were pretty gross. We, we don't have a live larder, but look, like, look at our freezers and look at our, look at our refrigerators. They're filled with like parts of animals. And so, I mean, who are, <laughs> here, I'm, I'm really on a roll tonight. Who are we really to judge the eating habits of the short-tailed shrew? Um, if it wants to have a live larder, is it any different than cooking up a lobster? Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Susie. You're uh, welcome. I think everybody enjoyed tonight's program. Let's give a uh, oh, hand wave for Susie's presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Thank you to the Chesterfield Conservation Commission and friends of the Chesterfield Library. I love, I love talking about animals. So give me a call in a couple more months and I, I'll do another one. All right. Good night. Thank you everybody for coming.